All right, good evening, everyone. Um, hopefully, you're encouraged tonight. Hopefully, I don't faint or anything. You're good. And if you can't tell, I am pretty nervous, so yeah. Have some grace with me, please. <laughs> there, it's working. All right, so starting out, just wanted to say a little bit about why I wanted to go. Uh, there's a lot of reasons. But probably the main one you hear a lot of is Matthew 28, the Great Commission. So I'd like to read that first. There we go. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Uh, verse 18, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things, whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So, uh, read this, you hear this a lot, and you always wonder like, what it means for you. Does that mean you just tell somebody on the street, or somebody you work with? Um, now obviously, there's different ways, and so it should start in your heart and where you are right now. But also, there's just something as being part of the bigger picture as well, something that makes you feel like you're doing a lot, but I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so another thing, another reason I wanted to go is Jessalyn went, and it looked like a lot of fun, and I could definitely tell that she had changed through it too. And so... That was, uh, yeah, that's what got me started on charge and maybe want to go. And also another thing is just, yeah, there is part of the travel, but also there's a lot of uh, charge. GTO gets you into places where you, you're not going to the resorts and relaxing. You're actually getting out into the country and seeing the way they live. And not everybody lives in houses. A lot of them have dirt floors. A lot of people in the world do. And they don't, some of them don't have walls, things like that. So, yeah, that definitely gives you a different outlook on the world. And, um, yeah, so I guess kind of getting into my trip, I went to Panama, as you can see. Uh, There's a place, Panama is just right in the bottom of Central America. So there's actually a jungle that separates Panama. It's, it is part of Panama, but it's kind of a separator between that and Colombia and, so, and South America. So, um, yeah, we flew, first day we flew to Bogota, which is where the base is, GTO's director, Christopher Byler, Chris and Kelsey. So, flew there, and that was sort of stressful for me, just leaving everything I've ever known. <laughs> it's the first time I've ever been out of country and the second time flying, so it was, it was, it was pretty fun though. And I met most of my team. So one thing about charge is, one thing I wasn't expecting about it is the team atmosphere. Just getting to working along with other people, trying to get along with these people you've never met before. That was something I hadn't thought about until I was there and met my team, basically. <laughs> and so we met them in Miami. Um, I have a picture of them later. I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about them. Uh, so most of them were from the U.S. And then I also had one, the one girl on my team was from Chihuahua, Mexico. And the edge leader on my team was from Colombia. So that was pretty cool, getting to work alongside a, a native Colombian too. So um, anyway, yeah. So the first couple of days I spent there were for orientation. They basically give you a lot more information than you can handle, <laughs> but it's all very good. 
And so something I wanted to share from that was uh, about the need for people to go. So if you turn to Romans 1, 18 through 21. Let's read that. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Yeah. yeah. This is as far as I was going to read. So, these verses tell you that um, God hates ungodliness, obviously, and unrighteousness. And as humans, we have a sin nature, so we are unrighteous. And um, because of the things he has made, verses 19 and verse 20 make it pretty clear that people know there is a God, and they know that he is sovereign. And the primitive tribes that we come across, they have they have gods, they know there's a God that created things. And so people know about him, but what they don't know about is Jesus die on the cross and the salvation he brings to them. So God, for some reason, decided to give that responsibility to the very people he's trying to save, the very people that messed it up. And so that is our responsibility and God trusts us to pass it on. And so that's the need people yeah, people need God to save them. I also wanted to read Revelation 7, verses 9 through 10. Uh, Revelation 7, verses 9 through 10. All right, verse 9 says... After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms of their, in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. So, the reason I wanted to read this is because verse 9 it says that all nations, all kindreds, kindreds and peoples and tongues will be before the throne. So everyone will be there. It's up to us to bring more of them. And um, kind of moving on, South America and Central America technically has a lot of Christians, but most of them are Roman Catholic. And a lot of them don't have a relationship with God. They don't understand what Jesus did for them. They know about God, and a lot of them grew up hearing about it. They believe it. They go to church, but they don't exactly have a relationship with God. They don't know him personally. So there's definitely a need there. And so, yeah, some of the things I learned in orientation, along with just street smarts and things you do, don't do in their culture, different things like that. Um, after a couple of days, our team, we flew to Panama, and it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of flying, though, for not flying be hardly before. It was a lot of, a lot of changing things, um, but it was exciting. And one thing I learned on that flight was how powerful a U.S. passport is. So you have to be very careful with your passport there because they will, if they get stolen, they're worth a lot, like 20000 30000 on the black market. So you have to be careful. And... We went through the airport and there was a very long immigration line and the workers came and we had U.S. passports so they looked at them and then they sent us through a special line that was just for Colombians that you could scan your passport and scan your fingerprints and you were pretty much through. We were able to skip the long line so as Americans we have one of the most powerful passports in the world so you have the opportunity to reach out to other people through that. And then we got to Panama City. Um, the next, that's the one I wanted, yeah. 
That is a place we stayed at for quite a while in Panama City. It was actually the president's beach, but we didn't know that. So we went, <laughs> found a nice beach that we could go watch the sunset, and we were, we were singing some songs on it as a group, and there was a guy waving us off from a building over across the way, and so we walked off, and there was a soldier there, where actually where we had walked in then, and they told us that it's the president's beach, and so we're not allowed to be on there. But I'm assuming the president wasn't there because they were very chill about it, and they weren't mad at us. The guard was laughing at us. <laughs> And anyway, we flew in in the morning. We didn't bus out until we took the overnight bus out of there. So we were sitting on a wall beside there most of the day, just walking around the city some. And on the bus ride, we were all tired, carrying our bags around the city. And so got on about 11 o'clock at night. And a lot of us went to sleep, some of us kind of on and off. And we thought this bus goes straight through to our destination. You know, we don't have to worry about stops. And it started stopping quite a bit. And eventually we decided this is taking too long. So the girl from Mexico went and talked to the bus driver and turns out we were at the border of Costa Rica. <laughs> so this, that's actually what this picture is from about six o'clock in the morning. And so we were able to find a bus there to take back to our destination city. It was about an hour back, and we actually still got back there before our contact, so God worked, out, <laughs> God worked that one out. Um, yeah. So we got settled in the place, uh, and let's see. The guy on your right, the shorter guy in front there on the right, his name is Barrington. Him and his wife, Carol, were the people we stayed with for the full four weeks. And this picture is from when we were working with YWAM. We worked with them twice, helping them. We helped pass out food and tracks. And we would pray with the people. The, a lot of these people, they're immigrants. Most of these pictures are. And they're from Venezuela and a few from Colombia and different countries. Quite a few from Haiti, actually. Excuse me. And they're coming, they come through the Darien jungle, which is one of the worst places in the world to be immigrating through. It's impassable, there's no roads, and it's full of uh, native tribes and drug gangs. And so if you make it through alive, there's not much chance you made it through with your money that you started with. So a lot of these people had enough money to come to America. It's their end goal, they're coming through Central America to the U.S. A lot of them had enough money, and a lot of them get robbed, and a lot of bad things happen there. So this is pretty much days after they come out of the jungles is where these people are. And we met one family that told us they had been stuck in the jungle for 19 days. They were lost, and they had just made it out. And so they, yeah, definitely try to encourage them and give them food because a lot of them are starving. And um, another place we went to with YWAM is a homeless camp in that city. And that was a very sad place. There's, it, the, that place specifically was all people that struggled with addictions. So drug addictions, all kinds of addictions, they were, that's what everyone who lived there had. And we took them food. And it was really neat to see the, the workers at YWAM. They went there regularly, and they, the people knew them. They could talk with them. It was really neat to see the relationship they had built with them. And a lot of these people, they would ask questions about God. And we couldn't really talk to them much except through interpreter. And so, yeah, we could pray over them, though, and pray for them, and God would reach out to them and one of the guys I met there just an example of kind of the people that were there but I have another picture actually it's a better picture of the where they lived one of the guys there I met talked about how he was seeing visions he could see things that would happen in the future 
And he was telling me he knew that somebody was going to die for the next week or so, maybe. And he was pretty sure it was a woman. He didn't know who it was exactly. But he had had visions like that before. They had come true. And I don't think those visions were from God. And so that's just a, the spiritual darkness in that place is, it was definitely, you could feel it. Like you, you just, you didn't feel good or you were tired after you left that place. And so we went, we went there twice. We worked with YWAM twice, did that. So that was a definitely a learning experience. Um, another place we went to, I'm just going to run through these, um, it was a church that our contacts have been to a couple times before. There was just one guy that spoke English there. It was an indigenous, they're called the Kamarka tribe. There's thousands of those in the mountains, thousands of those Indians. Uh, we simply went to this one church twice. And they were very, very nice people. Um, yeah, they, the children were really friendly and they're actually pretty well behaved. So they went really well. Well, they had, this is their church right here. So they had just a mud floor and a tin roof, but they had quite the band set up in the front too. So they, they must have invested more money in that than the church. <laughs> but while the adults had the service, um, some of us, sometimes some of us would talk, our contacts would talk, uh, like for their sermons and stuff. And while they had their adults had their service, we had the children in the back and we did skits for them. Skits and we'd tell them the Bible story then after the skit so they'd understand. And that was a lot of fun. We had to memorize the skits in Spanish. Yeah, they really enjoyed that. Gives them something they can see, get on their level. And then we took coloring pages, Play-Doh. The coloring pages we had were pictures from the Bible story that we told them. So that was pretty cool. And we had Play-Doh and balloons. They loved balloons. So if you ever go to South or Central America, the children love balloons. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I just got a few pictures from there. This is the Play-Doh. And I don't know if you can see the guy in the red shirt. His hat says, oh dear. <laughs> that was the coolest hat, but it has little antlers too. You can't really tell it on the picture. And the little girl right beside him, she would take her Play-Doh and she would slobber on it some and then she'd ask you to make something. And so you'd form something for her and she'd go running off and get somebody else to make something. And next time she'd come back, it'd be a little bit dirtier and a little bit messier. <laughs> you keep, I probably made 20 different shapes for her, just like over and over again. And the one guy I went with, he would be standing up and she'd come up to him and he'd put out his hand to take it and she would say, no, go. she'd do that. She didn't talk, she just, that. And so he had to squat down and then she would give it to him. <laughs> and so, yeah, she was a, an attention seeker. She just, one person to another, just the whole way around. And of course they love soccer. We played some soccer with them. And these people, they uh, come from a very sinful background. A lot of, Sometimes the, uh, they would start living together, the guys and the girls, when they're 13, 14 years old. And it's just a very sad, very sad uh, rut they had gotten into. And this, so this church was a very bright light in the midst of that. They had services Saturday and Sunday, and they would have like two hours in the morning and another two hours in the afternoon with lunch in between. So they had pretty long services but they were very nice people. Um, one of the verses I want to read was Colossians 3, 9 through 12. Find it here. Sorry, turn the slide on so I can find it. Colossians 
Colossians 3, verses 9 through 12. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and, having put on, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, vows of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. And so what I really enjoyed about this church is they were very kind. Um, we took food for them once, but we only did it once so that they wouldn't, so that, you know, the Indians wouldn't come just for that and become dependent upon that. But they made us lunch while we were there, and they were very, very nice, very friendly people. And so it was very encouraging to see them. And um, yeah, there's just a picture of some of the Play-Doh creations. The one boy was very good. <laughs> Made some pretty cool ones. And just a picture with all the children. It's all kinds of different outfits. This tribe of Indians is actually known for their dresses. They make very, they're all styled pretty much the same, but they're very pretty, bright colors. And that moves on to the next one. So, yeah, uh, we went to that place twice. So that was it's a fun place. Uh, we also went to a small church. Wait, yeah, I'm on the right page. Okay. We also went to a small church where uh, it's back in the mountains. A little bit different tribe of Indians, but kind of a similar thing. But they had actually concrete building and walls. But then they took us out to a uh, old rundown house where the children were. <laughs> there was about 20 children in a room about the size of a small bedroom. And so it was packed tight full. They had some couches there, but a lot of them just sat on the floor. And we just, we, uh, that was the day we were fasting as well. And so it was dark when we got there. and. We did our skit, which actually went really well for small spaces we had, and <laughs> they loved it. And then we had coloring pages, which couldn't really do because there wasn't enough room. So we brought out the balloons pretty early that night. And Indian children, they don't like to tie their balloons. They like to just hold it open and let it squeal. <laughs> and so they'll do it to each other's ears. You know, one boy will do it to another boy, and then he'll do it back. And they just love that. And they give it to you to blow it up, though. And so we were fasting that day, and some of the group were about ready to faint by the time we left because we kept blowing these balloons up over and over again. But they were, they were very fun. Um, yeah, there was another guy we met there. He's actually, I think he was from America. It was a very nice family that had a local house. He had a business there. And he had a sand volleyball court that he let us play on. And we attended his church two of the Sundays we were there. It was a very, a very nice church. They had yeah, very good services. Just felt a little bit like, kind of like being home, yet not really. <laughs> but they were very friendly people. We enjoyed that. Um, some of the things we did, we did some solo days where we basically get what you want and or what you can take with you and you get on the bus and you go to town and you have to spend at least I think one day we spent six or seven hours you couldn't talk to anybody in your group you might see them but you couldn't talk to them you had to talk Spanish to people and you, for a while you couldn't use Google Translate because you had to try to do it just with Spanish and so that was that was a lot of it was a uh, Stressful right at first, but then once he got into it, it was actually a lot of fun. He's able to spend a lot of time just completely away from anybody and to just, uh, yeah, worship God. And then also he tried to witness to some people, and that was, it was hard, but it was very good practice for us. And this one thing about the trip is it gets you into a different, uh, different place where you're not with people you know, and it's, 
it kind of gives you a jump start on witnessing because you're not worried about what other people are going to think of you because these people you don't know may never see them again. And so it kind of gives you, you know, it doesn't matter if you mess up this flight. <laughs> but so that was very good. Um, let me go through here. So right here, I just have some pictures of things we did around the house that we stayed at. Uh, they had a yard, but Panama is covered in rocks. There's rocks everywhere. So they couldn't mow the yard. So Alex spent, I think, two days. The yard was pretty big, and he had to we he weed eated the whole yard. And so that was that was quite the big job. And the one day he weed eated a pile of fire ants too. So he was sore for a while. <laughs> And some painting, painted a, they have propane, uh, propane cages. Down there, people don't steal the propane, they steal the tank because it's worth a lot more than the propane is even. And we actually set up a volleyball net for them. So our contacts, they're an older couple, they moved from the US about five years ago, I believe. And their vision is to start a place they're building on top of their house rooms where single moms with small children could come and stay for a while. Their goal is to reach out to the Indians, especially the ones that are in bad situations that just need to get away and provides them a place, a good Christian place to get away. And so we built a volleyball net for them and just did some random things around the house to help clean it up, painted some rails and stuff. And just thrown in the middle of this, some of the scenery you see is really cool. They had waterfalls, lots of waterfalls. And that is my group, along with our contacts, and a dog in the middle of that photobomb picture. <laughs> uh, that is one went pretty high up in the mountains. You can see the clouds are pretty close there. And it was really cool to see how, like, the way they farm on the side of the mountains. It's amazing. Um, and of course we had to go to the Panama Canal. We were only there one day because that was in Panama City and we flew into there and then bust out that night. And so we had to go there. And this is, we went to a place where they had, we were trying to look over the edge. Anyway, our contacts were extremely worried about us falling. They are always telling us, now don't go and kill yourself. <laughs> it's like, it's not our goal. <laughs> uh, but just so he didn't fall over, grabbing onto his leg to hold him. There's another waterfall. That one's pretty crazy how cool it looks. It looks like a painting, it doesn't look real actually. And that was a huge rock. So I was doing dumb stuff and the other guy came up behind me and I had my eyes closed so I didn't see this but I figured this was actually going on. So he has his big stick and he's ready to take me out. <laughs> Uh, this is a really cool canyon, super clear water, and it moves really fast. And here's another place we went to. So this is uh, a Chinese lady actually who runs this. About once a week, she'll go to this place up in the mountains, and she feeds a group of children that come. And there was probably 20 to 30 children the first time, and they told us that all these children actually come from about two families. And so there's a lot of, yeah, a lot of sad things that happen there. There was one girl we met there that she was 14 or 15 and she had two children. And they said one of them was from her dad. And so that is, yeah, the, the way they live and that's the only way they know. And so for our, our goal is to be, to plant a seed of God and that they would see him and seek him through that. Um, one of the guys we went with, and you'll hear more about him a little later here, his name was Johnny. He is a local pastor. He had gotten saved when he was around 20, I believe, and he was about 60 years old now, so he had spent 40 years. He had been through all through Central America, Mexico, to Canada. He had been around quite a bit, and... It's pretty crazy though. He, you would think he would be about 35, 40, and he was actually 60 years old. And he had quite a bit of energy. So he was a fun guy, a very, very good guy to be with. And he was one that took us to this place and several of the others. And uh, the one day, 
we went, we were going somewhere with him. We didn't know where until we got, until we picked him up. And then we found out we're going to the border. So we actually went back to the same spot where we went with the bus when we missed our stop. And so that was, that was pretty exciting. We went there, we bought food and made sandwiches and walked around, found immigrant families and we'd hand them sandwiches at tracks and we'd pray with them. And so that was a pretty cool time to go around and see those. And this pastor, Johnny, it actually tried to do that before, but he set up tables with food and the police had to break up the riot because there's so many people crowded around him. And so we put food in bags and would walk around and when we saw somebody we thought looked like an immigrant family and we'd talk to them and give them food that way. So it doesn't, and we try to move on quickly so they don't get too wild. So that was, yeah, that was definitely an exciting time. Uh, we went one time and then the second time we went, I think I have pictures of it. Oh, just going back to this real quick. I have another picture. They had this building and it rained both times we were there. And so they had the porch, was, had the roof covered half of it. And so they played soccer in there. And there isn't much room in between the ends, but these little guys had a lot of fun. And that was some of the f funnest soccer I've played. <laughs> the ball bounces off everywhere. And you can just, they just kick it as hard as they want. <laughs> it doesn't hurt anything. Uh, but these children, it's uh, just, yeah. They, ha they had whatever shoes they had. It's just that's all they had. And some of the guys you can see when they put their foot down, half their foot slides out the side of their shoe. And the one little boy that was the goalie, he would kick his shoe off and then kick the soccer ball when he kicked it out. His shoe didn't do much good for that. And um, the one day we went to the border, we made rice. Well, we made rice the day before, and the next day we chopped up tons and tons of veggies. And I, yeah, chopped up some onions and I cried for a while. And <laughs> did a lot, we made a lot of food that day. And then we actually put them in containers and we made over 215 servings of food in one morning. And so that was, that was a pretty stressful morning. There was a lot going on that morning. And a lot, of, a lot of the containers, we didn't get near all of them. We tried writing verses in Spanish. Since we couldn't talk to these people, we figured we'd write verses on their containers for them. But uh, we eventually decided we're gonna run out of time. And so we started writing Jesus loves you in Spanish. And I don't think we got all the containers quite, but hopefully they reached out to somebody that way. And that's writing the verses on them. And there's a picture of walking, uh, trying to find refugees or immigrants to hand them out, hand out the food to. And so, yeah, they just, they didn't have shopping bags down there. They had, uh, I don't know what you call them, plastic. They weren't plastic. They were like paper bags, whatever. <laughs> they take to the grocery store and they put their stuff in. And so we put the food in that. We had quite a few of those to carry around and we had a cooler that we went back and filled up with then once we ran out the first time. And we'd take gallon jugs of water and mix, mix up juice. So that was a fun time. Uh, definitely sad to see how these people were living. All the ones that we saw, they didn't have any money left basically. The ones that had money were on the buses and going to, heading north to Mexico. But definitely met a lot of people and hopefully made their day. Encouraged them in God and we tried to reach out to them. And through this is the way that I learned a lot about how faith works. Because Johnny, he would pray with them and he would help them pray to receive Christ. And I had a question about that. Like, do they think they have salvation then that they might not have? Like if they don't truly receive him, they don't change. And so I asked Johnny about that and well, the way he explained it is you need to have faith. So you, ask, you tell them about God and you, all you can do is plant the seed and you can't actually make them change. And so you need to have faith that God and this Holy Spirit will work in them because if you tell them about him, 
the Holy Spirit will work in their lives. And so I found out I can pray for people and I can pray whatever I want. They don't know what I'm saying and I don't know what they're saying, but the Holy Spirit will work in their lives and will be that little voice in their head that will uh, hopefully reach out to them and then somebody else, can, they can find somebody else to talk to and find God that way. And so that's a little bit I learned about how faith works, that you can do things that they don't even understand, you don't understand, and God can work it out. All you need to do, to do is plant the seed. And um, I have more. This, yeah, that's a camp where a lot of these immigrants lived, uh, right across the border in Costa Rica. And you can see some of the trash they have there. When we walked up to this place, we were scared to go there because of the riot that happened the first time when he handed out food. But our contacts loved children and they'd heard that there was 100 to 200 people here and a lot of children. And so they wanted to go. And when we set our food down outside the gate and got prepared to hand out food, it was, it was almost overwhelming to see the wave. There was like a wave of people that ran for the gate because they heard there was food. And we ran out of food pretty quick, thankfully, because if we hadn't, it would have gotten out of control pretty quickly. They, they didn't really stay in line. They just kind of circled around behind you, and pretty soon you're kind of surrounded. But we ran out of food quick enough before that happened, and they dispersed. So, And then right when we got done, it started raining. Before we got back to our car, we were soaked. But it was a good soaking. Um, another place we went, I don't have any pictures of it because they didn't allow us to take pictures there, it was the SOS Aldea home, children's home. And so this is actually an organization that works, and they started in Europe, and they work a lot of countries. They take children that their parents are in prison. So there's a prison right across the road, and these children are basically put in homes with people to take care of them, nannies or whatever, and they, it kind of gives them a home structure while their parents are in prison. And so that was, a, it was kind of a sad place to see uh, yeah, these children that don't have any parents really. But they loved our skit and the stuff, and so it was a good, it was a good time with them. And uh, one song, we sang a song there. We were singing One Piece Like a River and the whole group was just tired that day, and so we were singing way too slow. And Johnny, the pastor, he gets up in front of us and starts leading with his arm, like he's directing an orchestra. But he doesn't know what he's doing, so his arm's just going everywhere. And that wasn't enough, so he went over, our skit was David and Goliath that day, he went over and got the sword and started waving that around. And the whole group just had to break down laughing. And after that, the songs went much better. Yeah, that definitely helped a lot. So I'm thankful for Johnny. And it was pretty sad to say goodbye to Johnny then because, yeah, he was a very, very nice guy. And he said, if we don't see again, he said that if he doesn't see us again here on earth, he'll see us in heaven. So hopefully get to see him someday. And that's pretty much it's another thing. They're buses. So we took the buses quite a bit. And that was a lot of fun. This was a really fixed up bus, but they, they take good, pretty good care of them. And that is Johnny. And I think that's actually him directing us. It's a different place, but <laughs> he was directing us with a sword. And I actually learned how to cook some stuff. So we all had to take our turns making meals and things. So I cooked pancakes one morning. And this is... Uh, Going back to Bogota, uh, we, on our way back, we actually missed our flight to Bogota because we, we were so worried about this bus ride and whether or not we get our tickets and then whether or not we get off at the right stop. But we made it through all that and then we forgot to check into our flight the day before. So when we got to the airport, we went to check in they, we thought we were going to be early because you're not supposed to be there certain, before a certain time before your flight. And turns out 
we got bumped off our flight because we never we were one of the last to check in. So all our group was pretty stressed out by then, and people were not happy about that. <laughs> but they were able to get us flights to the flights to Bogota later on that afternoon. And yeah, I feel sorry for Celia. She's the girl on the left because she was the only one that spoke Spanish in our group at that point. And so she had a lot of responsibility. And, yeah, but she did well and we made it back. And the charge director also said we were his favorite group because he, he, want, he said no group had brought him either the Wetzel's pretzels, which is the yellow bag, or the Krispy Kreme that were in the airport. And <laughs> they had tried before, and nobody had done it, and we brought him both, so we were his favorite group for sure. Sorry, Jess. <laughs> uh, this is just a picture of Bogota. They have literally the worst traffic in the world. And <laughs> you can't even get insurance there for car mirrors because of the, so many bikers. So it's just a random fact about them. And that's one mountain we climbed up, uh, Mount Mozzarati. It's a very cool place. See, actually, we didn't climb it up, climb up it. We took cable cars up. It would have taken way too long to climb. There's a Catholic church on top, and so the Catholics can climb that mountain in penance to prove they're sorry for their sins to the church. Yeah, so we went up there the one night, and that was a really cool view. But it was also to, yeah, um, sad to know that these people feel like they have to climb that mountain on their, some, I think they do it on their hands and knees to climb up these steps to prove that they're sorry for their sins and it was sad to see how far they actually go and so they need God, they need Jesus and yeah we spent two days there debriefing, um, it was a very, very good time and this is our last night there and I think that's my last picture. So, yeah, this is in the Miami airport actually coming back. So the one guy I went with, he, uh, he loved Wendy's. So when we went to town, if we passed the Wendy's, he'd be like, oh, Wendy's, we gotta stop at Wendy's. <laughs> so we stopped, quite a few times we stopped at Wendy's. Because Panama is actually a very Americanized country and so they have a lot of these restaurants. And so we had to stop Wendy's a couple times and so when we got back to Miami in honor of him, he had got separated earlier because he didn't have a connecting flight, and so he got put in a different terminal. And so we got Wendy's in honor of him at the airport. And yeah, the team, our team connected really well, even though we come from very different backgrounds, a lot of us, and um, it was exciting to be there, but also it was probably more excited to come back home. So. My goal is to live out what I learned there, here. And in closing, I wanted to read 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 3. It says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is me, because that you're... Sorry, that's verse chapter 1. Chapter 3, verse 3. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from all evil. So, that's part of what I learned on my trip as well, that God is faithful and don't forget that. That's all I have.